from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We've done two so far, one on the Mapa Capital Akanfin, one on the Ostotipak lands map, and today we are going to do the Weochingo Codex, which, as Naomi said in the intro, is one of the top treasures here at the library. Um, this, uh, today we're going to take a little bit different um, tact on this. The other two codices that we looked at, um, the Quetzalcoatl and the Ostotipak lands map, um, are all one single sheet. Um, whereas the Weitzingo Codex uh, is eight sheets of um, amate, which is a mulberry fig bark paper, um, a typical indigenous paper from um, the Nahua. And um, it also has 79 pages of text associated with it, which basically narrate a, a lawsuit. And so we're going to be looking both at the text and at the actual codex themselves. The eight pages um, of the codex that are on Amate are also written in Nawa hieroglyphic writing, and we'll take a, a sort of deep dive into the, the Nawa hieroglyphs and the sort of symbolism we see on those pages. Um, but we have to first start out kind of talking a little bit about, about the court case itself, um, and we'll kind of go into some details. And it's going to be, like I said, a little bit different in format because I'm actually going to read a little bit of the translations of the some of the testimony and some of the material from the the actual book that the, the eight pages were found in, um, just so we get a kind of flavor of what, what these types of Spanish um, lawsuits and what these sort of Spanish law was um, as they affected um, both the indigenous peoples and, and the early settlers. Um, the way it's single codex dates from 1531, 1532, so it's a very, very early um, post-colonial codex. Um, first, though, we're going to look a little bit about what the paper is that the, these eight pages are on. Um, the other two codices, the Osotipak lands map is on Amate. Also, the Quetzalcoatl is on European paper. And we haven't really talked very much about the paper at all. And I thought I would just take a couple minutes to talk a little bit about about what the paper is and, and, and how it's made and kind of what it looks like. Um, there are really a couple of different kinds. Um, one made from the, the, the ficus uh, genus, and there's several different ficus species that are um, found in, in Mexico and Central America. Um, and this is a, um, basically a fig tree. Um, you'll see here, I've got just a botanical specimen um, from the National Herbarium, and then a picture of the, 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 the actually the ficus uh, padifolia. Um, on the right, and this is really what the kind of the paper looks like um, when it's made on the left. That's a sample of the of a modern sample of the paper made from the inner bark of the of the ficus tree, and then you can see it's very dark, um, very much like the the Ostotipak lands map was that we looked at last time. Um, today's codex, uh, however, is on a much lighter paper, and this really probably comes from the Morris genus, which is the a mulberry. And uh, it gives a much lighter um, paper. Again, it's made from the inner bark of the tree, um, and it's still made in, in Mexico today. The inner bark is pulled off and then and then soaked. Um, it get, becomes very very soft. Several things are added to the the bath in order to soften it, um, and then it's it's basically smeared and beaten. Um, and you can see here is a, an indigenous paper maker making sheets of paper uh, very much um, like we are going to be looking at today when we're looking at the, the way it's single codex. Uh, the way it's single codex is uh, on a paper that's almost white um, and it's uh, fairly thin but but a very durable um, paper and this is a, a typical um, um, paper making operation down in, in Mexico today. Um, and here are some of the um, pieces of paper and some of the um, various patterns put in the paper that are out drying in the sun after they're they're put down they're they're laid out in the sun and then once they dry you can you can then pick them up and they're as as rough as paper and so um, the codices that we're, codices that we're going to be looking at today are really um, this kind of um, this kind of paper and so um, without further ado we'll start talking a little bit about the codex. Um, so this is the first page. The, the codex actually 
um, what we have here is we have a, a lawsuit, and the lawsuit is actually brought by um, Hernando Cortez, um, the, the conqueror of Mexico, one of the first conquistadors to, to arrive there, um, and a man named uh, Marquez de Valle. And um, they're bringing up a, a suit against several people, um, a man named Nuno Guzman, uh, a man named Juan Ortiz del Milillo, and a man named Diego Delgadillo. Um, and basically, what is important about the codex is, and, and what happens in this codex is you've got 79 pages of Spanish text. And in those 79 pages of Spanish text, you have a narration of, of this court case. And basically, you have some of the um, native testimony, um, the indigenous testimony, the Nahua testimony, in many cases, refers to the actual Nahua hieroglyphic text that we see here. Um, almost all of which have to do with tribute um, and, and, and prices paid for various pieces of tribute, um, slaves traded and things like that. And we'll get into that in, in just a bit. Um, the Codex itself um, has an interesting history. Um, it was housed in the, um, the Hapital of the Immaculate Conception and Jesus of Nazareth in Mexico City for a very long time. And at some point, uh, it passed um, directly to Cortez's descendants, and those are the uh, Italian dukes of Monteleone. And those Italian dukes held um, the codex for a very long time, along with uh, a lot of other Cortez materials. And it remained in this private archive until 1925, um, and it was purchased um, by a man named Harkness in 1927 through a, a really well-known dealer, um, named A.S.W. Rosenbach. Um, Rosenbach was an extremely important rare book dealer and manuscript dealer um, during the 1920s. Um, the Rosenwald collection, those of you who are familiar with the large rare book collection here at the library, uh, a lot of those materials were also purchased through, through Rosenbach. Um, and so the subject of the, of the lawsuit um, is really this sort of misappropriation of funds. And the way a law case would work in, in, a, in a Spanish court of this period is much different than a law case would work in, in a law court today. Um, really what would happen is charges would be brought by some plaintiff, um, and the plaintiff would, would make up a questionnaire. And really this is actually a questionnaire which has a series of questions. Um, which he would then, they would devise and then they would give to their witnesses. And their witnesses would answer the questionnaire um, for a scribe, um, and the scribe would write down the, the, um, the answers. And so um, what we have in this codex is actually Cortez's side of the story. We have the information and the questions that Cortez um, and his side is putting to um, the Guzman side. And um, so after those questionnaires were done, um, they would be sent to the defendants. The answers would be sent to the defendants. The defendants would be given a particular span of time, um, and they would produce their own questionnaire, which they would then send to their witnesses. Um, there'd be another exchange of these back and forth between the defendants and the plaintiffs, um, and those would go to a judge. If the judge thought that the testimony was complete enough, he would render a decision. And if the, the court case was big enough, if there was enough money at stake, it may have to go back to Spain as opposed to being decided in, in Mexico City. But most of these local cases in, in, in the New World were, were decided in Mexico City. And, um, um, but in this case, we only have the one side. We only have Cortez's um, documents um, in the codex here. Now, what the codex begins with, it, it begins with um, a group of charges. And I'm just going to read a little bit because I think it's important to kind of get an idea of, of what the language is and how the language sounds. And obviously, this is a translation, but, but I think it's uh, an interesting way to kind of take a look at um, about the way these things were put forward. And it begins um, basically saying that this is a court case um, against uh, Nuno Guzman um, and several other um, people who are in charge of um, the area around Huayatzingo. Um, and the, it begins saying, I say that while my said party held and possessed by just and right titles and grant of your majesty, 
which justify and have justified the possession, use, and utilization of the Indians of the town of Waitsingo, which is in the province, and then there's a, a lacuna in the manuscript, taking the fruits and the profits of said town, the said Nuno de Guzman did in fact and against all right and without any cause or reason take from my said party the said town and the utilization thereof. So basically this has been appropriated, um, this town and the fruits of the labors and the, the, um, the important cash crops have been appropriated by Nuno Guzman. And it says, it continues, and they took and appropriated the said town for themselves, taking the fruits and incomes of it, as they have taken them from the year 29 past to the present, making use of the said town in all the enterprises they could, as well as services and other necessary things. And what is worse is that at the time when they took the said town from my said party, they published and said that they were placing it under tribute to your majesty. And basically the, the, the manuscript here um, literally um, says placing it in the head of your majesty. Uh, in order to, that they might make use of the incomes and profits of the said town. And in truth, your majesty has enjoyed the name, and they have taken for themselves and enjoyed the profit. And I think that's an interesting little little thing there. So basically, we have a group of people who are now been accused of taking um, a town over, which was basically given to the indigenous people um, for tribute. Um, they have said that they were taking it, uh, placing the tribute under the crown and giving it to the crown, but in fact, they were keeping it to themselves and only using the name of the crown and name, name only. Uh, some things never change, obviously. Um, and then it says, and since the laws of your realms, it is prohibited that judges should make such seizures and carry on such dealings and enterprises because they must keep their hands clean in everything. The said Nuno de Guzman, in doing what they did, committed violence, crime, spoliation, and notorious fraud, which in law is considered as a capital case. And so that is really the, the execution of the charges that begin the codex um, and begin the, the single codex. Um, and so, as I said, according to Spanish law, the next part of the, the case here would be for the plaintiffs to draw up some sort of, um, of questionnaire, um, which they did. Um, and in the case of the Way of Cingo Codex, it's a, a multi-point questionnaire. It actually has 14 independent questions, and we're not going to go into all of the questions, but there's one that's kind of important. Um, for what we're going to see as we actually go through the pages um, of the codex themselves. And it's actually number four. And what, what the number four says, it basically begins also whether they know and have seen, and this is put in the form of a question, so this is being asked to the witnesses, whether they know and have seen that as soon as um, and then it names the defendants, arrive in the city, they summon the lords and the leading men of the town and ask that they give and bring a certain quality, more than 6,000 pesos of gold ingots and jewels and also stones and feathers and clothing and slaves in an amount worth more than another thousand gold pesos. And let the witnesses say what gold, stones, feathers, clothing, slaves, and other things they gave to the said president immediately upon their arrival and on the road before they arrived in the city. And so this is basically a question um, asking witnesses that what kind of tributes, what sort of things were given um, to Nuno de Guzman and the other people by the leading men of the city? And were there these, were these demands made um, of gold and, and other kinds of tribute? And what we're going to see, actually, is when we begin looking at the codex pages here, we're just going to be seeing lists of tributes and lists of, of these kinds of items. Um, and we're going to see that basically a lot of what we have in the codex itself um, is native testimony, is indigenous testimony. And we're going to look at one in particular because at, right after that, we'll get actually into the codex pages. And one of the things that the, um, the way it's single codex is famous for is a, a small portrait of the, the Virgin Mary, um, considered to be the first portrait um, of the Virgin Mary in the New World um, that was actually rendered um, by an indigenous um, person. Um, what's interesting about that is people believe that somehow it was rendered um, 
for a reason of, of, of um, being pious or something like that, or making the codex um, somehow seem religious. But in fact, it's, it's, it's a little bit different than that. And we'll, we'll see that in just a minute. Um, so I'm going to just read a couple more little things, and then we'll get into the codex themselves. And um, I'm going to read the testimony, um, an answer to that number four. Um, by a, a an indigenous um, person, um, and that particular testimony begins. Um, it says after the after after the aforesaid is in the said city of Mexico on Monday the third day of the month of April in the year one thousand five hundred and thirty one through an interpreter Juan de Ledisma, the citizen of this city, a statement and disposition was received from Esteban an indigenous who was previously named Toshel, which in the Christian language means rabbit. From the said witness through the said interpreter, an oath was received in due legal form under the obligation which he promised to tell the truth. And what he said and deposed is the following. And so that's the way his testimony begins. And I'm going to read his answer to the fourth question, and then we're going to begin looking at the codex itself. And so um, he says, to the fourth question, he said that when Nino, Nuno de Guzman arrived in the city, the Indians of the said town Watsingo and its province did not come to it, nor did they go out to receive them, except that the Lord and leading men of the said Indians and this witness with them came to the city to see and know them. And they did not bring them any gold or cloth or anything else, except they brought food, hens, quail, possibly as many as 40 hens and 20 quail, and a little basket of eggs. And about a year after Nuno de Guzman had come to the city, the overseer of the said town, who is named Gibaya, who was reportedly gone to Guatemala, told them that they should give something to Nuno de Guzman when he wanted to go to the war. And they asked what they should give. And he told them whatever they wished. And they determined to make cloth with a sheet of gold, and the whole sheet of gold would be an image of St. Mary. This they gave to the said Nuno de Guzman, they and said overseer, and they brought it to him in this city. And for the workmanship and expense of what the said image cost, they sold 20 slaves, eight men, and 12 women. And they also, for three ingots of gold, which went into the said image, on the top of the cloth on which the image was placed, there were nine plumages, each plumage consisting of 20 feathers. And these cost nine loads of little awnings, with 20 awnings in each load. And this witness saw that Nuno de Guzman said to the Lord of Huatzingo that she, he should give him men to go to war with, 600 men outfitted for war after the manner in which they were accustomed to. And they gave them and with them also certain clothing and gear, which they have painted on certain papers. Now we're beginning to talk about the manuscript itself. And he asked that the said papers be shown to him. And he was shown one paper of certain paintings, which is signed with the sign of me, the undersigned notary and secretary. And when he had looked at the pictures, the said interpreter said, that in gear for the said warriors, they had spent 32,400 pieces of cloth and small awnings. And he, then he corrected himself to say that there were 27,600 little awnings. And this goes on basically talking about um, a whole list of things that were given and costs that were, um, costs that were brought um, all to go to war and all to make um, um, this image. Um, it actually ends. All this has been state. All this has been stated is painted on the said paper on which the depicted the said image of Our Lady and which is signed with my sign. And so, really, what we have here is we have this court case where we have a whole slew of pages which are going to talk about what were actually given to Guzman. Um, or appropriated by him in order to go to war, or um, spent by the um, indigenous um, uh, rulers of Huitzingo um, in order to make this gold image of the Virgin Mary. And so, really, that's what the, this this codex is. So let's let's get to the codex itself here, and we'll um, the codex. Uh, the eight pages are actually numbered, and um, they're actually numbered by the scribe who 
um, is actually writing uh, a little bit in, in this book. His name is Alonzo uh, Valverde, and um, he um, talks about the testimony, and he actually signs um, the, the, the images themselves. And so um, what we have here is we have the beginnings of um, this testimony. And we're just going to go over some of the symbolism um, here just because I think it's kind of fascinating the way that these things are put. And you will begin to get a sense of the, the huge number, uh, the vast array of tribute um, that was spent and collected by um, this group of people um, in order to make this image and, and for this going to war. Um, and so we'll look at the, the manuscript here and we'll, we'll begin, and hopefully this won't drive people too crazy, I'm going to use a little um, pointer um, to actually point out some of the things on the manuscript. When we, when we look at this one here, we see these two rings, and these are actually loads of lime. Um, and so we have here two, two loads of lime that have been um, put on, on this sheet. Um, B here is two piles of adobe bricks um, for construction. Um, this is uh, people have called the chocolate chip, um, um, the chocolate chip tribute. But this is actually what we have here is we have six, and those little flags are 20. So six times 20 loads of beans. Um, some things we don't know exactly what they are over this side. This is kind of an unknown group of of things. Um, this here is a um, another way of of um, of doing 400. You've got seven. Um, these things, and the, the, this is actually 400, and so we have 7 times 400 um, loads of cloth, so 2,800 loads of cloth. Um, and then, of course, we know this is, again, lime. We have some stones here. Uh, this part here um, is, again, we've got the same number, so 400 um, is this, this bundle, and this is maize up here, so we've got 2,800 loads of maize. Um, down here with the little heads, um, what kind of bird does it remind you of? Well, of course, it's a turkey, um, and so we have um, lots, of, lots of turkeys, um, and so uh, 140 turkeys, seven times 20. Um, this number down here in these little boxes um, is a huge number, and this is actually 8,000. So we have 2 times 8,000 or 16,000 chili peppers um, that are also listed on here. And really, the codex continues this way. Um, again, more, um, more um, amounts of turkeys and maize. Um, um, we've got the chili pe peppers. Um, and so um, this continues very much in this way. And this is talked about in the Spanish text, um, exactly where, where this is coming from and what it's being used for. Um, one of the most striking pages um, in the entire codex is this. Um, and what we have here is, of course, you can see that the, the numbers in the middle, um, those flags which you now know are 20. And these are 20 cloths with designs, and there's basically um, several different patterns. Um, there's a flower design, there's a rabbit design, and there's the design that looks like a reed. So we've got three different different kinds of, of designs here. And the entire cost is we've got 37 times 20, um, uh, which equals um, these cloths down here. Um, and all total, um, we've got about 460 flower um, patterns, 160 rabbit patterns, and 120 reeds if one adds this all up. And so these are cloths that, that, um, that are given in tribute um, that are talked about. Um, the third page, or fourth page, I should say, is this. And this is the most abstract um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the pieces. And really what these are, um, it's five cloths of ro woven red rabbit fur, and the total is um, 400 mantles, um, 4 times 20 equals 80, and then um, when you add them all up, you actually have 400 mantles of woven red rabbit fur. Um, now we get to the, 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 the Virgin Mary page, the page which um, the Codex is probably most famous for, and that Esteban talks about in, in his testimony. 
And this is a um, basically listing what it cost in order to put the, the actual solid gold image of the Virgin, which is portrayed here, um, um, together. Uh, and up here we have um, this symbol here. This is 400 pots of liquid amber. And so that's quite a thing. Um, then we've got this here is mantles of food, 400 mantles of food that one purchases in route. Um, 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 C here, um, you can see the feet, um, this group right here, there's four. And we now know, of course, this is um, 400, so four, 1,600 pairs of sandals um, are here. And we can go on and talking about this. And then, for instance, this, this is a banner for Don Tomé to carry. Um, it costs 10 loads, um, uh, 10 loads of mantles there. Um, then we have three gold plaques um, right here that, that are, are listed, um, used in the, in the standard of the Madonna. In other words, used to, to make the, the Madonna itself. Um, here we've got um, plumages. So um, 20 large green feathers, um, and we talk about the cost of, of, of that. Um, this here, of course, is the, the, the famous Madonna in the middle um, for Nino Guzman. And uh, it is 16 by 16 inches of gold leaf, um, and it's supposed to be one of the earliest productions um, um, related to Catholicism in the New World by the indigenous peoples. Um, and then here we've got 21 gold plaques, the thickness of three fingernails, um, to purchase a horse for Don Tome, uh, the principal and brother um, of the Lord of Huachingo. Um, here we have metal tip darts um, and the group of, of metal tip darts here, um, and then loincloths along the bottom here, and then we have slaves, um, um, groups of slaves in order to, um, 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 who are sold to the, by the Madonna. And this is an interesting little thing here. We've got this group of slaves along the bottom here. Um, and these slaves, at least according to the testimony, um, were actually sold to uh, indigenous merchants um, to buy the gold um, in order to make the Madonna. Um, uh, and so um, it's quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting page, um, this figure which um, um, people talk about so much. The next page here, um, these are two Aztec war leaders um, with different shield designs. Uh, there's 11 houses, um, basically, who contributed to the work, so basically 11 different family lineages um, who contributed warriors to this supposed war effort that we were talking about in the, in the testimony itself. Um, and then we, we have um, the numbers of warriors um, along here. This basically gives us the numbers of warriors, and then we have woven bags, and then we have blankets. So um, again, uh, more about the same same stuff, same type of issues. Um, again, here we um, have another page, this time talking um, more about grain. This is a, a granary up here that we see. Um, so it's a, a, an indigenous granary holding maize, um, um, which was paid in 1529 and 1530, so just before um, the, the actual codex is made. So the events the codex is actually narrating are between 1529, which is the date that's given in the, when I read the initial charges, uh, that it begins in 1529 and we are in 1531. So this exploitation um, and this, this um, um, taking out of, of money and tribute in order to go to war uh, by this group of people um, against Cortez um, or, or um, stealing from Cortez basically happens over a two-year period. Um, and so um, it gets more and more complicated as the, as the, the text goes on. There are uh, about 20 to 25 different testimonies from the indigenous peoples um, within the, um, the thing itself, within the actual codex itself. And um, that uh, really does give us um, a real sense of of how these cases are narrated and, and really how important this was. Um, when we start looking at some of the numbers and adding up some of the numbers, um, 
for instance, when we look at this number right here, when we look at this right here, we, we basically have a total um, of about 8,000 turkeys here. So um, it's a substantial, um, substantial amount. Um, when we go down to this row down here and we see the, the corn here, we're talking 32,000 ears of corn. And here we're talking about 48,000 chili peppers. So this is a lot of, a lot of money um, that has been uh, exploited or, or misappropriated in, in way of Chingo by, um, by Nuno Guzman and um, the others who are named in the case. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot tell you how the case turned out. And as I said, we only know um, really the one side of it. Um, there are some documents which give us hints to the, to the other side, but they don't give us much in the way of, of conclusive evidence. Um, and it seems as if that this particular codex survived mostly because it went into the hands of, of Cortez's um, descendants, um, um, the Dukes of Monteleone, um, and uh, that really is, is how it survived. And so I would be more than happy to, to take any questions. Um, um, and uh... This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.